Hello, everyone. Welcome back to All Team Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson. Today, we are going to be talking about the impedance of differential lines over hatched ground planes in a flex PCB. Now, recently, we had Lucas Hankel back on the podcast to get an update from him on some of the open source projects he's been working on. If you remember that original podcast episode with Lucas, one thing you may remember is that he was working on stuff with a flex PCB, specifically for a camera module in his open source laptop. Now, flex PCBs need to have a hatched ground plane. You could use a solid plane, however, it will be very difficult to bend that flex PCB if you do that, therefore we prefer hatched ground planes. But of course, when you're transferring high-speed serial data over that hatched ground plane, what happens to the impedance of those lines? That's what we're gonna look at in this video, and we're gonna look at some simulation results. Let's jump in and get started. Now, as I mentioned in the introduction, we recently had Lucas Hankel back on the Altium On Track podcast, and he was working on a flex ribbon to connect a camera module to the motherboard in his open source laptop project. Now, of course, flex ribbons used hatched ground planes, and determination of the single-ended impedance and the differential impedance over hatched ground planes can actually be quite difficult. This is a complex simulation problem, and of course, it's due to the geometry and the structure of a hatched ground plane. Let's take a look at a short clip from our recent podcast episode, and we can get some sense as to why these simulations are so complex. The ribbon cable itself, or the flex cable, still needs to be very flexible because it has to go over the, the hinge uh, mechanism in the, in the laptop lid, meaning we have to make sure we're still within our target impedance, but we also have to make sure the flex cable is still well, flexible and won't break after um, after a few cycles. And doing this requires um, using as little copper as possible in the flex region, but also making sure that we are still um, hitting our, our target impedance means we have to use a hatched reference plane but that now comes with the challenge of calculating the impedance over a hatched reference plane for those differential pairs. And there is no easy way how you could approach that analytically. So there is not a simple equation that you can just use that spits out the, the target impedance based on the fill factor, for example. You actually have to go through the whole simulation process. You have to mesh this very intricate and complex uh, a hatched reference plane with, with all the differential pairs above it and try to work out um, the, the target impedance in, a, in an iterative way. So just to summarize the remarks from that clip, when you have a hatched ground plane, you have a lot more detail in the copper that makes up that ground plane. That, of course, increases the complexity of the mesh needed to create a numerical model for that ground plane. And then, of course, that increases your simulation time. So unfortunately, you normally need a 3D field solver in order to compute the differential impedance or single-ended impedance of a trace over a hatched ground plane. Now, let's take a look at one of Lucas Henkel's designs for this flex ribbon, and we can see the kind of detail that's involved here. So here here on screen, I have one of his flex ribbons brought up. You can see here that as we zoom in on the bottom layer, we have this hatching. You can see some DRCs here. Let's just ignore those for now. But you can very clearly see the hatching on the back side of this flex ribbon. And you can see we have single-ended traces and differential traces. Now, what are these different traces? Well, first of all, if we just zoom in here, we can see that we basically have some configuration traces and some GPIOs, and we have an I squared C interface as well. The other thing that we have here is the data coming from the camera. And the data coming from the camera is transferred over a CSI link. So this is one of the MIPI standards. And in the CSI link, you basically have data lanes and then a source synchronous clock lane all running in parallel. Here, you can see we have our clock lanes right here. They're denoted clock positive and clock negative. And then here we have our two data lanes. In higher resolution cameras, you may see four data lanes, each transferring at 2.5 gigabits per second. That would then give you a 10 gigabit per second serial interface. Now, with this being a high-speed serial interface, of course, these differential pairs are impedance controlled. So you need to hit in a differential impedance of 100 ohms. Let's take a look at the stack up manager in Altium Designer to see what the differential impedance would be if we had a solid plane. And then we'll jump into Symbior to see what the impedance is with a hatched plane. 
So if we just jump into All Team Designer's Layer Stack Manager and we go to the Impedance section and we plug in the trace width and the trace gap, you can see here that it says our differential impedance is basically 57 ohms. Now that's pretty low. We of course need a differential impedance of 100 ohms. Now what I've done is I've loaded up this board in Symbior and if we look in Symbior, we can see what happens with the differential impedance as we look along the length of the link. Here you can see that very close to the connector, we have a pretty high differential impedance. And then as we scan along the link, we can see that the differential impedance exhibits a lot of variation ranging from as low as 57, which is what we calculated in Altium Designer, all the way up to, you can see in this region, about 130 ohms. So we have all of this variation along this link and that extends all the way across over this hatch ground plane and eventually down here to the other end where we have our other connector. You can see that it also varies when we look in the straightaway sections versus when we look in the curved sections. The curved sections also have their own variance and it looks like the values where it's varying are a little bit lower than 100 ohms and they're a little bit lower than the values in the straight portion of the link. Now, why does all of this occur? Well, of course it happens because we have these openings in the hatched ground plane. Those absences of copper create regions in the ground plane where we would expect a trace routing over that region to have higher impedance compared to a trace routing over the solid copper region. I discussed this in an older video on hatched ground planes. Let's take a look at a clip from that video. And so the relative area that is covered with copper divided by the total area occupied by this plane or this polygon that determines the impedance of this transmission line is called the fill factor or FF. So the fill factor is gonna be a number that is essentially less than 100%. This essentially starts to look something like fiber weave because when the fiber weave effect occurs, you don't really notice anything until the bandwidths get very large or until this fill factor gets very low. And when this fill factor gets very low, we have a lot of spacing in between these copper lines. Now, I brought up a mathematical factor in that video that we can use to describe the amount of copper that makes up the hatch ground plane, and I called that the fill factor. So what's a good way to define the fill factor? Well, I've come up with a more recent definition, which I'm gonna show here on screen. I've defined the fill factor, FF, as being equal to one minus this area fraction, between the hatch area or the area of the opening divided by the total area uh, of the repeated element that makes up the copper. So what is this repeated area in the hatch ground plane? Well, if we go over here into Altium Designer, I think we can find a way to define this repeated area. Basically, if I just zoom out, I look over here in this square section, you can see here that there's a portion of this copper that you could cut out that basically repeats everywhere in the hatched ground plane. That area can be used as a fraction to define the fill factor. Then if you're gonna be doing some designs on flex PCBs and you wanna calculate different impedance values for different spacings in your differential pair, you could then calculate the differential impedance as a function of that spacing and a function of this hatch opening, which would then give you a fill factor value. Now, I'm certainly not the first person to look at this problem. Take a look at this blog on the Altium website. As I scroll down here, you can see that we have some data from Worth Electronic. This webinar that I've cited down here contains this data, so I encourage you to take a look at this blog and then go take a look at that webinar. Here in this graph, you can see that they've plotted differential impedance over different thicknesses of polyimide film as a function of the crosshatch copper area. What we see in this graph is that as the crosshatch copper area increases, where we put more copper underneath that trace, the differential impedance goes down. I think that's equivalent to basically moving that set of traces closer to the copper ground plane. And of course, in a rigid PCB with a uniform ground plane, we would naturally expect that also gives us a lower differential impedance. So I think all of those results jive. Now, all of this business with calculating a differential impedance is nice, but of course, as we can see here in Symbior, it does vary along the length of the link. Because of that, what are we supposed to do in order to qualify the performance of this link? For that, we need to then look at the S parameters. So in order to do this, you could of course do a full 3D simulation here in Symbior, 
or you could do a fast SI simulation. What I'm gonna do is set up a fast SI simulation. I'm gonna let it run, and it's gonna take a while because there's over 2,000 transmission line sections in this design, but we're gonna let it run, we'll come back, and we'll look at the S parameter results. Now I've exported all of this data into Excel. You can see here that we have a whole bunch of data here in these columns and I've created some graphs here that we're gonna analyze. Now what Symbior calculates is the mixed mode S parameters. Basically it calculates what happens if you put in either a differential signal or a common mode signal. And that'll be important here in just a moment. But first let's take a look at the return loss and insertion loss. Now here with the return loss plot, you see we have SDD11. So this is differential mode return loss. Basically I put in a differential signal, it tells me how much of that differential signal is reflected as a differential signal. Now you can see here that we have sub negative 10 dB return loss up to above one gigahertz. Now eventually the return loss does get pretty high. However, this channel is only operating at up to 2.5 gigabits per second. So we have sufficiently low return loss within the required channel bandwidth. Take a look at the insertion loss plot. The insertion loss plot is also acceptable all the way up to the required channel bandwidth limit, but eventually you get really hard roll off and it looks like we have some anti-resonances here at really high frequencies. I'm wondering if this is basically like periodic loading that you would see in a glass weave substrate operating at like tens of gigahertz. So this is something that RF engineers know about and it's one of the reasons that we like to use glass unreinforced substrates at very high frequencies. But I think the copper hatching in this hatched ground plane is actually creating these dips in the insertion loss plot. Now these plots are only measuring what happens with differential signal, meaning I put in a differential signal and I get out a differential signal. So that's basically what this insertion loss plot is showing. I put in a differential signal and it shows me the amount of loss that differential signal experiences as it travels along the link. How do common mode signals play into this? Well, we actually get something called mode conversion in these structures where we have asymmetry or discontinuities along the length of the differential pair. That's exactly what we have in a hatched ground plane. And mode conversion essentially refers to the conversion of differential mode into common mode or common mode into differential mode. So here what we're looking at in the bottom set of plots is the differential to common mode conversion in terms of S parameters. So what are we looking at on the left? Well, the left plot essentially measures the reflection of differential signal as it's converted to common mode noise. So in other words, I put in differential signal, but what reflects out from that input is common mode noise. And that's essentially what we see here in this graph. So we have some pretty high mode conversion. It does reach up to negative 30 dB at a reasonably low frequency, only 100 megahertz. Once we get up above one gigahertz, we do see some significant mode conversion. I'm not sure of the mode conversion limits in CSI2 links. If anyone knows, I encourage you to just put that in the comments and let me know so we can see if this channel actually meets channel compliance standards. What do we see here in the other plot? Well here, this other plot is kind of like an insertion loss plot, but basically it's saying how much of the differential signal is converted to common mode signal as it travels down the link and then leaves through the output port. So that's what this plot is showing. So this SCD21 plot basically tells us how much of that differential signal is lost during propagation. So why do we care about this? Why do we care about the conversion of differential mode to common mode as shown in this lower right plot? Well, the reason is that if that differential signal is converted into common mode signal, what's the differential receiver gonna do at the other end? It's going to cancel out that signal because of course it's a subtractive measurement at that differential receiver. So that portion of the differential signal that gets converted to common mode is essentially lost. Now it's also important on a structure like a cable because if you have common mode noise on a cable or common mode signal on a cable, it can radiate very strongly and that could be an EMC problem. Now you can see here that this mode conversion also rises up to a pretty high level above 100 megahertz and once we get to one gigahertz, we have about negative 20 dB of mode conversion. Again, I'm not sure if this is going to violate channel compliance requirements for this particular link. So if anybody knows the answer, go ahead and put it in the comments. This is something that I would normally have to look up in the standard to see if it's actually going to qualify. So what's a good takeaway from this discussion? Well, I think there are a couple of things. 
First, if you are using a standard impedance calculator that calculates impedance over a uniform ground plane, of course you cannot directly use those results. But I think you could use those as kind of a decent estimate or a starting point for determining differential impedance over hatched ground planes. But what's much more important is not just the impedance, but it's actually the mode conversion. As we see here in our S parameter results, we do get significant mode conversion once we get up to high frequencies, and some of that mode conversion is actually seen inside of the channel bandwidth requirement. So that's something that requires a 3D simulator, and it's a much more involved calculation. But it's definitely something that I'll be looking into as a research project, and so as I come up with some interesting results, I'm definitely going to show them here on the channel. Thanks for watching this video, everybody. Make sure to go check out that podcast episode with Lucas Hankel. It's a very interesting discussion, and you'll get to see some of the cool open source stuff that he's been working on lately. If you like this video, make sure to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, leave your comments and questions in the comment section. And last but not least, don't forget to call your flex fabricator, folks.